on page 681 in my Bible, if that'll help you any. We studied the first two chapters, and we want to finish this tonight. And uh, these are great parting words of the great Apostle Paul. He wrote half the New Testament, but the urgency of these last two chapters show that he knew the time of his departure was at hand, that his life would soon come to an end, <coughs> that Nero would put him to death, not because he was a criminal, but because he was a Christian. He often calls himself the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning he wouldn't have been in prison were it not for his relationship with Christ. But instead of complaining about it, he said, but the word of God is not bound, 2 Timothy 2, 9. And in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, he said, brethren, pray that the word of God might run and have free course. For what they do with me is not important. He wanted the word of God, of which he wrote much, of the inspired uh, books that it would be well known and circulated. So really when you're dealing with the end of a great Christian's life and he knows the urgency of his soon departure, it really becomes even richer material. Many years ago, and I can't remember exactly the name of the book, but I was in the library at Abilene preparing some radio sermons that I was doing for the first time. I was about 19 and a half years old. I had about seven Sundays in a row in Mineral Wells to preach on the radio, and it scared me about half to death. And so I'd go up there on Saturdays and do some work and write it out and read it. Uh, but it came time with a 15 or 30 minute program, whatever it was. But uh, I read a book where they interviewed uh, men, great men, great gospel preachers just before they died. The last words of some of the best-known gospel preachers of the hundred years prior to that. And it was really, really interesting what some of those men said. It was very touching, in fact. And nearly every one of them uh, had the hope of eternal life, but their love for the Lord and how good that he had been to them and the hope of heaven, those kind of things that really were what great men would say when they come to die. Then I was privileged when in a meeting in Lexington, Kentucky, to go to the most beautiful cemetery I've ever seen. And some great statesmen of Kentucky and Tennessee and the southeast were buried there. Like as you go into that, there's a huge statue of Henry Clay on his favorite horse in bronze and so forth. Uh, those kind of people are buried there. But about 10 of the real outstanding gospel preachers, like Raccoon John Smith and J.W. McGarvey and men like that are buried there. There's some interesting things on their tombstones, and uh, it really is kind of an enriching type day as you meditate upon <laughs> these things. And I remember reading in uh, something about uh, what Brother Earl West wrote in Search for the Ancient Order about J.D. McGarvey, that just before he left to go overseas for the first time, uh, London, some literary society in London had pronounced him the greatest Bible scholar in the world. Uh, uh, back in those days, about 15% uh, oh, of the population of the United States were members of the church. And the restoration movement was thriving. But he wrote that the last thing McGarvey did before he left to board a ship, I guess, uh, was to go into his library and say goodbye to his books, how much they'd meant to him. And you can tell in writing, reading his commentaries, especially on the book of Acts and a book he called The, Land of the Lands of the Bible, a sort of a geography uh, of Bible lands, uh, how reverent he was toward the scriptures. Well, here comes Paul at the end of his life, and he's an inspired ambassador of Christ. Uh, he's an apostle. He's done great service, once converted to Christianity. And just the urgency of everything he says, especially these last two chapters, rich as cream. All right, chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, Something that never ceases to boggle my mind is how the televangelist will say that end times are just about upon us. How could Timothy be instructed about the last days and beware of what would happen in the last days when he lived in the first century? 2,000 years have gone by, and yet these televangelists haven't come to the last days yet. 
he tells Timothy to beware as we'll continue reading these first five verses of what's going to happen in these last days. Well, Timothy must have lived in them. And Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says in, the, in these last days, God speaks to us through his son. That's 2,000 years ago. Joel said it'll come to pass in the last days. And eight centuries later, Peter on Pentecost said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Acts 2, 16 and 17. Those, if those fellows are 2,000 years behind on such a simple thing as that, how can I trust them on anything? This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. <laughs> in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, when he said that, he said, and the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Notice the decline there. They're first disobedient to parents, then they're unthankful, and then unholy. And that's the way it works. You know what's wrong with the United States of America today? Disobedient children. That's who's filling up the penal institutions. All they talk about when they have a campaign for governor of Texas is we need more rooms, more jail cells for criminals in the penal institutions. When I was in Pampa in a meeting several years ago, they just built the newest and latest and largest of all the new uh, penal institutions in our state. And they say one reason they built it at Pampa was it's so flat out there, if a fellow escaped, it'd take him about 15 years to get out where they couldn't see him on the flat ground. There wouldn't be any hills and mountains and trees to hide in. But the point is, where do these criminals come from? From homes where there was no discipline where they were allowed to be disobedient to parents and then marched down Main Street against the United States of America and all governmental authority. Uh, that's where it comes from. If you're disobedient to parents, you become unthankful and unholy. And in Romans 1, when you list the sins of the heathen in the first century, right in the midst of murder and thievery, adultery, he said, in those who are disobedient to parents. That's what the Holy Spirit writes in the book. Those just go together. And parents who allow their children to sass them, talk back to them, mock them, ridicule them, treat them like cur dogs, are sending kids straight to the penitentiaries. That's the one to fill it up and overflow. So they were that way in the first century too as these last days began to unfold. In fact, as I read that, uh, covetous, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Sounds like up to date. Throughout the last days, first century to now, those are characteristics of ungodly people. I remember reading years ago in the Reader's Digest, this man left the company, and uh, the boss man, the owner, said to him, said, I hate to see you go. You've been just like a son to me, surly, disobedient, discourteous. Without natural affection, and that brings in homosexuality and lesbianism, in Romans 1, also he lists how that men lust after men. Without natural affection, truce breakers, they don't keep their word. Their word is not their bond anymore. False accusers, incontinent, in words, they are unbridled. They have no containment of their emotions or their life. But the Bible says bring every thought into captivity unto Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. And to think on things that are pure, Philippians 4, 8. Fierce, despisers of those that are good. That word fierce could describe most of the motion picture industry today. And all these games that kids play. Uh, the dungeon stuff and all that. I don't know the names of them, but I know what it's all about. Who can be the most cruel? Who can kill the most people in five minutes? Who can stack them up in the corner and burn them? I mean, that's the world we live in. And when you start on that, TV and motion pictures don't know where to stop. They just keep getting more fierce and more fierce. You know, every once in a while, I'd sure like to see a movie, and I don't go to any of the movies, but I'm talking about on TV, on an old channel, where there's a plot to it, and people are kind and good, and you might even shed a tear because people are so nice to one another. Well, nowadays, if they don't have about nine people killed in the first scene, there's no plot to it, see? Which is no plot and no plot and no plot. Despires of those that are good... That's another trait. The people who are doing good and being what they ought to be are made fun of, laughed at, called a bunch of oddballs. Had an interesting phone call today. You know, you get so many of these deals where they uh, uh, want to sell you something. 
I don't know who the American Institute is, but I've been called 411 times by them. And I don't want any of that stuff. And if I want something, I'll go where they sell it and ask them to come, you know. But, and it's nearly always at a bad time, you know, like I'm about to swallow some chili or something. <laughs> but a fellow called me today and he said, I'm so-and-so from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And I said, we take it out. It's more news. I'm just about to hang up. He said, wait, I didn't, I'm not trying. I want to interview you. He said, someone told me you'd be a good fellow to interview on this December 25th business. And it was one of the most interesting interviews I've ever had. And he just, he just kept on and on and on and on. If he puts one third of what I said to him in there, it'll fill a page. And but I thought that was interesting. And he, he said, someone, he acted act like several that said, I'm the one that need to get to the other side of this matter. I thought that's interesting. But today we <laughs> live in a time when, what? Well, you'd be amazed at how he, he really was very cooperative. And he just, I said, now, if you put this in here, I want you to put in what I say. And don't call me reverend or pastor. I said, I'm an, a preacher of the gospel. I'm an evangelist. He said, I'll put preacher, evangelist, I promise you. And, well, we'll see if his promise any good. But it's going to be pretty interesting. But the main point I made was that the Bible tells us to emphasize the death of Christ. And I said, in churches of Christ, we do that every first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 7. We remember his death till he comes again. And he said, this do in remembrance of me. The world emphasizes his birth for Roman Catholic sake and for merchant sake, but the Bible emphasizes his death. And the gospel is the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. And there are 365 days in a year, and we ought to give all the time. We ought to be givers all the time. And not give because they gave, because I gave, because they gave. Uh, anyway, it was pretty interesting. Uh, I could tell he was interested, if nothing else. He said, it's a little bit different than some of the other things I've heard. So no wonder they told me to call you. <laughs> <laughs> Traitors, heady, high-minded, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own understanding, Proverbs 3, 5. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. If you'll read Numbers chapters 15, 16, and 17, you'll read about high-handed sin. Presumptuous sin, Psalm 19, verse 13. Sin, you sin on purpose. You're high-handed about it. You're arrogant about it. You think it's funny. Sounds like our world today. And what nearly all motion pictures and TV programs are designed to emphasize. Lovers of pleasure <coughs> more than lovers of God. Johnny, uh, talking about high-handed sin, you, you get the same thing in Hebrew 10, 26, Hebrews 10, 26 through 31 is the best paragraph I know in the New Testament on that. Because he finishes by saying it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29, we're to always, always serve God with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. That's a great commentary. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31, really. Uh, years ago, an aunt of mine, that probably the, my favorite kinfolk of all time, wrote me a letter, and uh, she said, uh, would you please answer for me what the psalmist meant in Psalm 19? Uh, Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sin. Let me not be guilty of the great transgression. I'd never thought of that exact point, and I began to study it. Well, I'm sure the great transgression was the sin of Adam and Eve that introduced sin and death in the world. And it was a presumptuous sin. They knew better. God had spoken clearly. But they presumed that he didn't know what he's talking about, and they listened to the devil. And so sin and death entered the world, Romans 5, 12. And so I wrote back, and then I wrote an article on Psalm 19. <laughs> and I believe one of our biggest problems today is they don't like to retain God in their knowledge. They sin willfully. You remember in Malachi, they'd been home 100 years from captivity, and now they're worse shape than before they went into bondage. And they were saying about worship, it is a wearisome, tedious, boring thing. And he said, do you notice the sacrifices you're offering to God? They violate everything in the Levitical code. They're sick and lame. He said, won't you give that to the governor of Persia and see what he thinks about it? They knew exactly what they were forbidden to do and what they were supposed to do. So that's high-handed sin, just like in the New Testament, Hebrews 10. So when he comes to the end of Hebrews 10, he said, we're not of those that draw back to perdition, but of those who believe unto the saving of the soul." So turning back to perdition and presumptuous sin and high-handed sin, 
all about the same thing. And then in Amos 5, 12, he speaks of their mighty sins. I wrote an article years ago that appeared first in the Gospel Advocate out of Tennessee when Brother Guy and Wood was the editor, and it was a good paper. Uh, I call it uh, Sin in Four Dimensions, and I brought in all these kind of passages. Having a form of godliness, <coughs> but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. How could Timothy turn away from these things would happen in the last days unless he is living in the last days? The first five verses of 2 Timothy 3 ruin the televangelist argument about the last days are about to be upon us, which is a part of their premillennial heresy. So he was to turn away from these things that happened in the last days, but he lived in the first century. So they must have existed in the first century. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women. I didn't say that. That's what the scripture said. I've seen a few silly women and two or three silly old men. But anyway, and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with divers lusts. It's very easy to lead some people astray. I'm not paralleling these two points. But how could these con artists ever talk people into some of the schemes three or four or five thousand dollars worth where they just robbed these elderly people uh, how could people not see the scam coming it just it's this old song of you can't get something for nothing but somehow somebody convinces these people usually on the parking lot of a bank that you're going to get something for nothing i think down deep uh, that, that was built in they want more that's right and isn't it a shame that there'd be crooks that would prey on older people whose minds may not be as sharp? I'm probably the only 70-year-old person that's just smarter and smarter every day. <laughs> I can't remember my name, but I'm almost sure that's true. Yeah. Let me tell you what these people are trying to do now. They're trying to put air conditioning in hell. <laughs> that's exactly right. They got these people fooled. Yeah. I think they sell asbestos suits and air conditioning at the same time. <laughs> I only bought two of them, so don't jump on me. <laughs> Led away with <laughs> divers' lusts. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that does really define a lot of people there. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Because instead of seeking truth, they're listening to guys like old Benny Hinn. I wonder how anybody could, couldn't see through that. A man that has that kind of a permanent on his hair. So something, you know, and I'm not envious. <laughs> I could shine my head as well as anybody. Never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And the more flamboyant it is and the more spotlights they have and the more technicolor. I was in uh, the Kansas City area in a meeting in Independence, Missouri, across from Kansas City several years ago. And uh, I noticed in the Sunday paper on the front page of the Kansas City Star, I believe is the name of it, one of the leading newspapers in America, the leading one along with St. Louis Post-Dispatch in the Midwest, had a front page picture of old Benny Hinn under the spotlight, and I'm telling you, they dressed him down. They called him a charlatan, a fake, a bogus fella, and all the pseudo miracles that didn't happen. And You talk about strong, you'd think a gospel preacher wrote that article. The next day, as I went out to the airport to get on the plane to come to Dallas, who was there? Old Benny Hinn, with two big old look like professional tackles as his bodyguards, and they sat on the front seat of the first class, you know. And, uh, but I thought the gall of a fellow like that—he probably had eighty thousand dollars in his satchel. That's about what many of them take for a one-night stand sometimes. But I thought, how does he live with himself? He knows that's not right. It's like how does the Pope go to bed at night knowing he's not infallible and yet everybody calls him that. You know, that'd be miserable to crawl in bed there by yourself and realize you're the biggest fake in the world. How do you get that infallibility? 533 bishops and cardinals in Rome in 1870. 1870. All of them admittedly fallible men voted infallibility upon another man. How could that be? It can't be. Why can't they see that? 233 left Rome lest they have to vote on it. They knew it was absurd. But it's just been since 1870 that he was called infallible. And he knows he's not infallible. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, now we know who those Pharaoh's magicians were. We know their names. I have to come right here to find their names. Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. So do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But you remember after about the third try at duplicating the plagues and the miraculous effort of Moses, they gave up, admitted they couldn't duplicate it. There could be some sleight of hand artistry on certain things. When it came to the genuine article, they bowed out. And so he's saying these people are ever learning, never able to come to knowledge of truth. They're like a bunch of soothsayers out of Egypt. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. You remember when Paul struck Elam as a sorcerer blind in Acts 13 on the first evangelistic tour? He said, O child of the devil, full of all subtlety and mischief. Paul did him a favor. He struck the magician blind so that he couldn't fool people anymore. All his means of the hand is swifter than the eye and so forth went down the drain. Paul did him a favor. Well, the best thing that ever happened to Paul was being struck blind. What the blind man saw? Saul of Tarsus saw some things when he was blind he'd never seen before. Number one, he was wrong. Number two, Christ was what he claimed to be. Number three, the religion of his fathers wouldn't do anymore. He saw more in his blind than he ever had before, so he did Elimus the sorcerer a favor. That wasn't being unkind to him, but he said, You're a child of the devil, full of all subtlety and mischief. So Janus and Jambres and Elimus all go together. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest, made known unto all men, as theirs also was. <coughs> when the genuine is put against the counterfeit, it doesn't take very long. I was in Anaconda, Montana, in a gospel meeting years and years ago. One of the most foolish things I ever did in my life was drive from Fort Worth to Anaconda, Montana by myself and drive all the way back. That's about as far as you can get and stay in the United States of America. And they had a different time zone. I'm not talking about mountain standards. They had a different time zone in that part of Montana than the rest of Montana in the Northwest. I had to have the call the preacher. He had to meet me out the edge of town and guide me to the building. I'd never been there before and had already sung two or three songs. And I'd driven about as well as you can drive all the way up there. Oh, it's Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. But they were circulating some bogus $20 bills in Anaconda and Butte. And they always laughed and said, if we just turned them over and looked at it, it wouldn't be difficult because the old $20 bills have the windows of the Treasury building at such an angle that they can't be duplicated. It said most of those bogus ones had the windows all the way down or all the way up. <laughs> so it was pretty evident that it wasn't good money, you know. Well, it's pretty evident when people know the Bible, where are false teachers coming from? But if you don't know the Bible, they can sell you a bill of goods. Sell you the Brooklyn Bridge and some uh, desert out in Arizona and uh, the Everglades in Florida. as a good place to build a house. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, and the word doctrine simply means teaching, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came upon me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, read Acts 14. Beaten so near to death, his comrades thought he was dead outside Lystra because he was preaching the gospel in a pagan region. When he revived, he went right back in the city that nearly killed him to preach some more. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why then do we still pray, Lord, may we not be persecuted? May we always have the freedom we have the Bible says all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall have persecution. Are we praying we'll not be righteous in Christ Jesus? We ought to pray. Help us when we are persecuted to be faithful anyway. That's more scriptural. We have a cockeyed view of the Bible because we haven't studied thoroughly. We should never, ever pray that we'll not be persecuted. You say, now that's crazy. Well, let me ask you a question. When did the church of the Lord grow the most it ever grew? When it was persecuted. Intensely persecuted. By today, we blend it in with society. We don't cause a ripple on the stream. And a lot of brethren don't even want me in the pulpit to preach very plain, to hurt our little feelings. Much less someone that needs to hear the gospel plan of salvation. We're upside down on this chart. God, we pray, Lord, help us to so live like Jesus that we will be persecuted so we can share the truth with people and remain faithful in spite of it. That's a lot more scriptural prayer. We even have a song in most songbooks. I haven't checked this one. 
the song title is, We Gather Together, and one stanza says, May thy congregation escape tribulation. When this says, All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. Second Timothy 2, 11, 12. We've already been over that one. With much tribulation, they, the early Christians, entered the kingdom. Acts 14, 22. The church never has grown like it did when it was intensely persecuted. In Acts 17, 6, says when the, Christ, when the apostles came to Thessalonica, the people of the city said, here come those men who turned the world upside down for Christ. We need to cause a ripple on the stream. And this old song of a nice meeting house and everything so comfortable and convenient and inner sanctum religiosity and we don't get out on Main Street and let people know where we stand. And then when they come inside, we have watered down, meaningless preaching that wouldn't convict anybody. We need to get back to what the Bible says. And when we live like Jesus, we'll probably be treated like he was. He is a perfect preacher, and they crucified him. Spat upon him, reviled him, ridiculed him. How can we get near to what Christ was? And he said, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, and not cause anyone to dislike us. But some brethren are looking for preachers today, and they want a guy well met, hale and hearty, might be voted best citizen by the Junior Chamber of Commerce given a plaque by the Rotary Club. We've got to understand we're to be distinctive, unique, unusual, different. <clears throat> Jesus said, you are not of this world because I've chosen you out of this world. John 15, 19. Peter said, we're pilgrims and strangers. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 11. And so we need to get back in concert with 2 Timothy 3, 12. But, notice the contrast, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I don't know how many times in the last 15 years I've been asked, Johnny, do you think the church is ever going to return to its moorings of yesterday? No. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. I'm a historian. There's a principle right there. Once apostasy sets in, you don't stem the tide of that. You may cause more people to be more faithful and loyal than they otherwise would have been. But the idea that a great panacea is going to happen somewhere out here, did you know that both Campbell and Moses Lard believed in a form of millennialism that went something like this? Before the world comes to an end, righteousness is going to be revived. Sin is going to be put down. And there's going to be a universal reign of righteousness. That's not what this verse says. And in what 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, and 3 and 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 12 says. It says that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And when will it end? When the Lord comes and slays them with the breath of his power. The idea that things are going to wind down and get better, that's against history, it's against human nature, it's against the Bible. Now what we must do is be challenged to reach out in the world and draw people heading in the wrong direction into the ecclesia of Christ. So they'll be faithful when the end comes and the Lord comes. The Bible does not teach anywhere that just before Jesus comes there's going to be universal righteousness. It teaches no such thing. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I sometimes dream and even pray for and think about, and whether I should or not is another matter, but that surely sanity is going to return to the United States of America. And the good old innocent, honest, law-abiding, God-fearing, people-caring atmosphere will be once more in our midst. But as I honestly look out there, it's getting worse. I haven't seen it get better. Human nature is just against that. Take the restoration movement. Once they quit saying we speak where the Bible speaks and are silent where the Bible is silent, Look what happened. J.W. McGarvey, for instance. And I've studied about him and read about him, been in that area a lot where he lived. After he died, and he was one of those who took a strong stand against the Missionary Society and instrumental music and worship, when they buried him in Lexington, Kentucky, at the funeral service in the church building there, his own daughters had instrumental music played at his funeral and later kind of mocked and made fun of his old fogey stand. That's his own family. 
Everybody in the New Testament church knew where he stood. He wrote it. He spoke it. He taught it. And then even his own people at his own funeral did him a grave disservice. It's one of the saddest things that I believe I've ever read. So I don't think, I think we're whistling past the graveyard. If we think all of a sudden we're going to wake up and everything's a whole lot better worldwide. Another thing that compounds it is for the first time in years and years and decades, if someone in Timbuktu, and there is such a place, I saw a sign at the Nairobi airport as we were about to board the plane uh, in Nairobi. Uh, I saw a sign at the end of the tarmac that said Timbuktu, 1,100 miles. Well, I thought Nairobi was about to jump in off place, you know. But there is such a place. But if something happens there in the morning, 20 seconds later, the whole world will know about it. Used to, it took a year and a half. And then it wasn't a full report, and then it was old news. So the devil is shrewd and sharp. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. <coughs> In other words, whatever happens to the world, here's what you do. And thus my lesson tonight is not a lesson of doom and gloom. Whatever the world chooses to do, I can't control that. I can convert some people out of the world into Christ. But I can't change the world of the devil, the prince of the air, of this world, if you please. Ephesians 2 is in charge of so many people. Not that he should be, but that's what people submit to. But regardless, he says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. You and I can be faithful <laughs> if no one else is. One of our problems today is we can't stand not being popular or in the mainstream or having someone point their finger and say, you're odd, you're weird, you're strange. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Here's that oasis in the desert of sorrow and sin, the Holy Scriptures. And he had a mother and a grandmother, as we studied about 2 Timothy 1.5 uh, Sunday, that taught him from childhood the Holy Scriptures, which can counteract the world and cause Timothy to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord instead of be overwhelmed by carnality, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Every once in a while, I about it's been about five years since I've read this. This is one of the most thought-provoking little poems, and you've heard it before, but I haven't heard it in a long time and haven't read it in years. Every parent, every grandparent ought to think about this. I took a piece of plastic clay and idly fashioned it one day, and as my fingers pressed it still, it bent and yielded to my will. I came again when days were past. The bit of clay was hard at last. The form I gave it still it bore, but I could change that form no more. Then I took a, a piece of living clay and gently formed it day by day and molded with my power and art a young child's soft and yielding heart. I came again when years were gone. It was a man I looked upon. He still that early impress bore, and I could change it never more. What if Timothy hadn't had a mother and a grandmother like he had? What if Paul hadn't ended his life when he did? We'd be devoid of one of the finest young Christian men in the history of the world, built into the accolades of the Bible. Paul said, I have no other man just like him. He cares not for the things of himself, but for the kingdom of God. Somebody must have built into him a fervor for truth, a zeal for righteousness, and molded and shaped Paul's son in the gospel. Paul was grateful, and Timothy was grateful. We need those kind of builders that take seriously what they're doing. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. When I come to die, I really cannot be responsible fully for what four children we brought into the world would be like. But if when they were under our jurisdiction in our home, when we had control, if you please, we taught, as this poem said, we fashioned a vessel of honor for God, if we live before them as a Christian. I don't believe I'll res be responsible for the day of judgment when each one gives account of himself unto God, Romans 14, 12. It may break my heart, for John said, I have no greater joy than to see my children walking in truth, 3 John verse 4. But they're not puppets, they're not robots. I don't have them on a string. And once they leave my home, as our oldest son will soon be 47 years old, 
and others are 45 and 43 and 41. I believe somewhere along the line, they became individual responsible. That doesn't mean it doesn't soften the heartache, but the point is I need to be sure that while I had them in my jurisdiction, in my home, under my influence, that I taught them the truth. I lived the truth before them. I pled with them to obey the truth. Now, if I fail to do that, that's going to be against my record. I still believe the greatest accolade for any Christian man or woman is when they die and they're laid out in that casket if their children would come by and say, my daddy or my mother was a devoted Christian. Now, what they may have done after that and with their own life, I don't believe I'll be answered before. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scriptures give them inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, the King James says, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So it's all sufficient, it's inspired, it's inerrant, it's infallible. We just need to get it into our hearts and lives and show deep respect for it. One thing I tried to do in that interview today, and for some reason this fellow reacted a little bit differently than some have. Uh, this is about six times I've been interviewed by Dallas Times Herald of days past, the Dallas Morning News, Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and other places where I've been in citywide meetings as the preacher. Uh, but this is one of the few times a fellow would ask me more questions and seem very interested and seem in no hurry at all to, <coughs> to leave. But every chance I got, every opportunity I had, I said, we believe this because of, and I'd quote the scripture. This isn't something we just dreamed up. Here's what the Bible says. I hope, if nothing else, whether he prints it right or prints it all or part of it, I hope above all else, I made an impact upon that one man's life for scripture, scriptural authority. All scripture will make you complete. And from a child, Timothy, you've known the Holy Scriptures. That's our job. That's our task. We bring children in the world. Do we get the word of God to them? I'll be forever grateful to my mother and father. They didn't have near the opportunities I had that they gave me from their background who studied their Bible, prayed, attended every time the doors opened. We attended every gospel meeting within 30 miles of our house. I don't care if I had 10 in the summer. We was over at least once. Don't know how many old bald-headed preachers we had in our home, too, and I ate my chicken up to where the only piece I know is the wing. I, I'm sort of addicted to the wing. That's the only taste I ever developed. But <laughs> my point is they gave me every opportunity to want to be a preacher, to be a faithful Christian, to study the Bible, to serve God. And if I fail, it's not their problem. It's not their fault. I'll be forever indebted to them. They believe these verses that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. I charge thee therefore, notice therefore, that's the key word. That's the hinge word that ties what's preceded with what follows. Based on what I've just told you, Timothy, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that is the living and the dead, at his appearing in his kingdom, <clears throat> preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. There's what a gospel preacher does. He tells the truth. He is insistent, instant, always zealous when it's convenient, when it isn't, when people like it, when they don't. To reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Reprove and rebuke would be what men would call negative, and exhort is what we should call positive. And the Lord doesn't make that distinction. He just says, do all those. I don't know how many times in the last 20 years I've heard brethren say something I never heard before that. I just don't like negative preaching. Isn't that strange? That's a negative statement. I don't like negative preaching. They're negative about negative preaching. Don't be negative. It's hard for them to be negative about me not being negative. Strange. You're judgmental. Well, they have to be judgmental to call me judgmental. Why can't people see that? It looks like it wouldn't take a genius to figure that one out. But if the Bible says, reprove, rebuke, exhort, that's what we're commanded to do. Let the Lord decide if that's negative or positive. Let's just obey what the Bible says. Jeremiah, I put my words in your mouth, therefore tear down, destroy, and plant and build. First two are negative, next two are positive. You have to get the debris out of the way before you can put the foundation of truth. When you're planting a garden, you got the rocks and the stumps and the Johnson grass up before the good seed can be planted and bring forth. We understand this negative, positive. 
And I'll say it again. We couldn't get off the parking lot tonight if at least wasn't post on the battery wasn't negative. These people that don't want anything negative would, I guess, be stranded here all winter long. For the time will come when they will not who? Brethren, he's talking to Timothy working with the church in Ephesus. They will not endure a sound doctrine. But after their own lust <laughs> shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. And I think it's interesting, endure a sound doctrine. Instead of having to endure it, we ought to enjoy it. We ought to look forward to sound doctrine. That means healthy, wholesome teaching. You want it sick and unhealthy? But some people have to endure sound doctrine instead of look forward to it. Attitude is the key right there. Having itching ears, they'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned into fables. Always somebody will scratch their itching ears. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And the word ministry means service. Now here are the classic words you've heard all your life. For I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, as a result of this, there's laid up for me a <laughs> crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. You read what he's saying there? Whatever my reward is will be the same reward for everyone that loves his appearing. This is another passage that makes me believe strongly there is no such thing as degrees of reward in heaven. I do not believe the Bible teaches that. If Paul could say the great apostle Paul outdistanced us a long time ago spiritually that whatever I receive, you'll receive, where are the degrees of reward? I believe everybody in hell will be in the same place. I believe everybody in heaven will be in the same place. You won't have a more golden mansion or a golden street than I and vice versa. If we make it, we'll be there. We'll be where? In heaven. If we don't, we'll be in hell. As a little boy said, every last one of us. Well, we're going to finish this someday. It's rich. <laughs> Out on the bulletin board, I want you all to look at the picture of the preacher and his wife from Jamaica. It gives you his name and lists where he comes from and what he's doing. In the morning, he's leaving to go back to Jamaica, his home, and stay the rest of his life. And this congregation has agreed to help Philip uh, Brown and his wife and little boy as they return to their homeland to preach. And Sunday night in a business meeting, we had such a great meeting of uh, helping spread the gospel, and I was willing, I mean, was able to take the check and other things to him on Monday, and it, he and his wife were overjoyed. But it's one of the nicest looking families out there you ever saw. And that little boy is something else. Here, there's a future preacher we're going to be helping. So look at that. It has his address down there and his picture and his write-up about him. I think you'll appreciate that we're having fellowship with him in the gospel.